In this video, I'll show you how to restore an A501 RAM expansion that's been in storage for a decade or two. We're still waiting on the cap kit for the Amiga 500, but I thought I'd get a head start by taking care of the RAM expansion. It only needs three capacitors and a battery holder, and I already have all of those on hand. If we take a look, you can see it has only about 300K of RAM available. The rest is already being used. So by adding another 500, that should get us up in the 750-800 range. You know, I think the A501 would probably make a good first project for a retro newbie. It has a battery that can cause leakage, it's got a few caps to replace, it's relatively small and fairly inexpensive to replace if things go awry. You can even get a new circuit board from PCBWay and transfer your parts over if you need to. There are two versions that I'll link in the description below. One of them uses the original connector so that you can transfer your existing connector onto it. These connectors can be hard to find, so there's an alternate one that uses a more modern connector that's compatible. And no, this video is not sponsored by PCBWay, but I really do appreciate how much that they support our community. So, as you can see, this RAM expansion comes in this sturdy metal shield. And this is an original version, an early version. My understanding is that in later revisions, they skip the shield altogether. And I'm gonna go ahead and do the same. Once I get this done, I'm gonna leave the shield off. Um, it's a bear to get into. The battery holder I'm gonna be using requires replacing a coin cell battery every two to three years. So I don't wanna have to be unsoldering this every couple of years. Don't worry, I'll keep the RF shield in the Amiga's original box. I prefer to do all of my restorations with as few irreversible changes as possible. After removing most of the solder with a desoldering pump and solder braid, I found that the easiest way to separate the halves was to put some pressure on the shield with a small screwdriver while applying heat. The tabs are not bent over, so once the solder is hot, they slide right out. If you do plan to reuse the RF shield, then make sure you don't lose the clear plastic insulator that protects the bottom of the circuit board from shorting on the metal case. Just as I feared, there is some damage from a leaking battery. It could be worse though. The damage seems limited to the area immediately around the battery. I sure wish the Amiga 3000 damage was this little. I tried to desolder the battery, but one lead was just too corroded and its solder would not flow no matter how much new solder and flux I added, so I finally resorted to cutting it off. Then I just pushed the remaining bits through the board with the tip of my soldering iron. This dark patch around the leaking battery is where the copper is oxidized under the solder mask. If this is not stopped, then it'll continue to spread even though the battery's been removed. After thoroughly cleaning the board with isopropyl alcohol, we use a fiberglass scratch pin to carefully remove the green solder mask from the affected area with a bit of extra margin around the edge. Once that's looking good, then it needs to be cleaned well with vinegar followed by alcohol. Next, we'll add a new protective coating to prevent the exposed copper from reacting to oxygen in the atmosphere. One thing you don't want on your vintage electronics boards is a nice green patina. That is not good. Bad. Not good. There's a few ways to protect the area. One of the simplest is just to coat it with a nice layer of solder. Just heat up the copper, melt solder to it, and that'll protect it from the oxygen. It just looks janky and I don't like it, so I'm not gonna do that. Another option is to apply a new coat of UV activated solder mask, which is what I'll do today. Finally, back in the day, we would just use a bottle of the girlfriend's nail polish. Be sure not to use a sparkle or glitter type, as they can have metal in them. I prefer to green or clear coat myself. Nail polish can also be used as a Loctite and to ensure that adjustment screws and pots don't move after being set. A tiny dab is all it takes. Here I'm removing the old capacitors. I'll speed through this since we've talked about soldering and desoldering in previous videos. Just remember that it's harder to desolder corroded solder, so use plenty of flux and add a little fresh solder before desoldering. Mm -hmm. 
once one leg is free, you can just apply heat to the other one while gently pulling on the part to remove it. Finally, just clean up the pads with some solder braid and you are ready for the new parts. Soldering in the new parts is a very quick process. Just be sure to observe correct polarity and that the solder flows through to the other side of the board. One thing that really bugged me back in the day was you had to buy the A501 RAM expansion separately not only to get the extra 512 of RAM, but also the clock. And a battery backed up clock just seems like a no brainer. Um, funny thing is, is looking back from today, that's a good thing because the battery for the clock is in the RAM expansion. So I suspect that countless Amiga 500s, including this one, have been saved because any leakage is confined into here. I also decided to replace this one resistor. It had some crusty bits on it and I had one on hand. Now, I have definitely seen online pictures of these where the leakage has actually crossed the barrier, crossed the uh, connector and caused damage to the machine. Uh, but I suspect a lot of them have been saved. Since a coin cell holder is going to cover the area that we've exposed where the acid damage was, I'm going to go ahead and get the solder mask on there first. So I'm just going to take a little bit of this stuff. It doesn't take a whole lot. A lot of people complain that they don't come with a plunger. Well, the plunger out of uh, Flux works just fine. And I'm using an old paintbrush on here, but we need to leave the area around where we need the solder to stick, needs to be left alone, left exposed. This is UV activated. So once I get this on there, I'll show you how I'm gonna cure it. Okay, so now we need to cure it. And since it's uh, UV sensitive, what I'm gonna use is a UV lamp made for doing nails. And yes, I happen to have one of these. I thought those would go well on miniatures. It didn't work very well. So what we'll do here, so we'll set this up. I have to do this about 10 times from what I've read. This takes uh, about 10 minutes to cure. Of course, if you don't have one of these, you could always cure it in the sunshine. Well, that's nice and dry. So next, we need to put this on. The battery holder I bought from Amibay exactly replaces the old nickel metal hydride battery and already has the needed components to prevent the computer from trying to recharge the non-rechargeable coin cell battery. Also want to use a little bit of Deox D5 in the connector. We'll also put a little bit of this on the connector in the machine. All right, now we just got to let it dry. Let's take a look and see how it's working. Then, if it works as expected, I'll explain why my results may be different than you expect. This is showing up as chip RAM instead of fast RAM because we modded this machine in the early 90s. 
The memory map on the Amiga 500 was set up so that only part of the memory was accessible by the custom chips like Fat Agnes and Denise. This is known as chip RAM because both the Motorola 68000 processor and the custom processors have access to it. The Motorola 68000 has to wait to access it if the custom chips are using it. The remaining memory, called fast RAM, is always accessible to the processor, effectively allowing the processor and one of the custom chips to work at the same time. The problem was that the A501 was sold as fast RAM, but it was mapped in a part of memory that was not accessible to the original custom chips, but was blocked from the processor if chip RAM was being used anywhere. That's the worst of both worlds. Later, Commodore upgraded the Fat Agnes that could only access 512K of RAM to the fatter Agnes that could address one megabyte. So, back in the day, we did what is probably the most common mod on the Amiga 500. By replacing the Agnes chip with the newer version, then cutting a trace and changing a jumper on the motherboard, the A501 can be accessed by the custom chips, changing it from slow RAM to true chip RAM. We also had Supra SCSI hard drives in the Zorro slots that had a few megs of true fast RAM, but alas, those drives were lost somewhere along the way. And there you have it, the RAM works, the clock works, and we're all good. I hope you enjoyed this video, and here's another video you might like. <laughs>